going to get started with the next um, section of this session. Uh, we're going to hear from Eugene Cook, who is visiting us from Atlanta. Um, he started a company in Atlanta that's called Grow Where You Are, and they transform vacant lots in low-income neighborhoods into um, urban farms, urban community gardens, that sort of thing. He also owns a food business with his wife that he may wish to speak about as well. All right. Hey, y'all. How y'all doing today? Mm. Okay. So what I'm going to do is ask, uh -uh. what I'm going to do is ask, who's an activist? Raise your hand if you're an activist. All right, good. Raise your hand if you're under 30. Keep your hand up if you're under 30. All right, perfect. So those that have a hand up, starting in the back, right there, young lady, right there, you. Why are you here? What are you trying to get out of this today? Other hands, the, the, the under 30 folk, under 30 folk, hands back up so I can see y'all. <laughs> All right, um, young lady in the back, because you're a mother, and we've been seeing how you're handling your child, and you and your mate are doing a great job. Why are you here today? brother up in the front, can you tell me what you've heard that's been consistent throughout everything today? One theme that you see that is resonating with you that may be something we need to focus in on that would be consistent. Uh, I think we all, uh, we all want to see um, a society where, where we're all, you know, uh, working together, we're all safe, we're all happy, we're all free. Um, it's a, it's a society of compassion, um, nonviolence, peace, um, and justice. Um, and I, I think we're all extremely upset at all the injustice that's going on in the world right now. Um, there's so much injustice, you know, uh, in our food system, and I, I think we're all, we all want, you know, the same goal. So we're all coming at it from different angles, and so by working together, I think, you know, we'll be able to create that that beloved community that like Martin Luther King talked about, you know, and, and many other, you know, um, I guess just uh, 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 activists for peace have talked about um, historically. Thank you. So I'm going to land right here. So my name is Eugene Cook. I've been growing food for about 20 years, and I've never been a part of any activist movement. So I'm really honored to be here. I'm honored that Nassim reached out to me. I'm honored that Brother uh, Chema has opened his space and his heart. And to be in San Francisco was amazing. Uh, last time I was here was 20 years ago. I started growing food in South Central LA. I'm from California, born and raised, born in Long Beach. Um, started doing work at Crenshaw High School and under the tutelage of a gentleman by the name of Adana Jamia Mora L. And we transformed the back of Crenshaw High School into an urban farm. And we did that without any funding. One of the things that I've heard, and to piggyback off what you said about Dr. King, that a lot of people don't understand, the reason why the civil rights, human rights movement was so powerful coming from Atlanta, which is one of the reasons that drove me to Atlanta, is because the people were willing to go to jail. They were willing to go to jail. They were not paid after this. They were willing to go to jail. The reason they were willing to go to jail, and this information is coming directly from a man who walked and worked alongside Dr. King, who I happened to plant plum trees in his backyard, and he pulled me inside and told me this story. So the reason they were willing to go to jail was because the folks in the city of Atlanta who were deciding they were going to go for this human rights activism went out to the farmers in Georgia and said, listen, we're going to be doing some major, major protesting, and we expect to be put in jail. We need to be able to get out. And the farmer said, we will put up our land as collateral for you to get out of jail. So it was always farmers and landowners who have done these movements. So what our elder was speaking about with the Zapatistas, how they said they take nothing from the government. 
I think I want to impress upon all of you, these are very crucial points because when Dr. King and the activists went into jail, the black farmers put up their land and said, get them back out. And then they went right back to the streets and kept doing it. And the next black farmer said, here's my land, pay that money, get them out. How many of you own land or families own land? Okay. You have a valuable asset. How many of you who said your families own land, that land is owned inside of a city? Okay, the numbers changed a little bit. If you have a, if your family owns land and it's outside of the city, get out of the city. Stop arguing and complaining and combating the city dweller or trying to stake claim to a city. The city is toxic, both in its chemicals its design, and its attitude. When we have people who have attached themselves to the land and valued that land, a different thing builds in your heart. A different kind of courage builds in your heart. A different kind of compassion builds in your heart because you go about the process of nurturing something. And when you start to nurture something, when you start to have that responsibility, it becomes a very different ideology about how you're going to address people and how you're going to address grievances. The highest expression of human existence is creativity. So I'm asking you, are you being creative in how you're looking at the situation? Are you being creative in how you're coming to these problems? Because when the civil and human rights movement began, it began on the back of land-owning growers. I'm a grower, and I have been invited to a few of these functions in different places, never with quite as a uh, rooted group as y'all. From what I've been learning from Brother uh, Chema and from the sister Nassim, and from listening to what I've been hearing today, is that San Francisco is a place of a lot of activism, a lot of community organizing. That's amazing. And from what I'm also hearing, a lot of the tactics are from the human rights movement. But they don't have the same strengthening unit of land ownership. And you also don't have the same guiding factor of people who get up with the sun and go to sleep with the, with the moon, who can explain to you the seasons and the cycles and give you a pulled back view of what is really happening here on planet Earth and how these, these colonizing strategies, they're as consistent as they've ever been. But they get really creative, don't they? We heard the brother talking about the sodas, we heard the sister talking about the milk. Still colonizing strategies, but their creativity is 10 steps ahead. If you continue to organize in the way that happened in the 1960s and you don't have the undergirding of the 1960s, what can happen? If you continue to organize in those same ways and yet you're being paid by government structures, that the very people you idolize like the Zapatistas would never take that money, never take that money, then how can you be effective? This is just a challenge because y'all are my family. This is from the heart. You understand? This is from the heart. Every single day I grow food. I have fed thousands of people from Atlanta, LA, Kenya, Haiti, Jamaica, Washington, Texas. I have no degrees, none. I have no organizations, none. People come to me and they say, brother, you should start a nonprofit. I got three children. Can you pass a nonprofit to children? Can you pass a nonprofit to your children? No. no. Come on, y'all. You know better than this. So we do live in a capitalist structure. And in this capitalist structure, you need vehicles to do your business. And you can choose whatever vehicle you choose. How many of you drive a car? OK. So if you drive a car, please don't have any conversations with me about destroying capitalism. <laughs> because you use that vehicle to do what you need to do. So we started Grow Where You Are. If you have a smartphone, which I'm sure you do, growwhereyouare.farm, completely spelled out, dot F-A-R-M. 
We started that. It's a vehicle to get things done inside of a capitalist system. Somebody said earlier today that farmers are capitalists, and there's nothing wrong with that. A farmer literally is the, is the truest materialist there is. We are extraordinarily materialistic as farmers because we deal with fire, air, earth, water, ether. We're dealing with those materials to actually generate wealth from nothing. So these vehicles, we have a choice of how we're going to do things and how we're going to use our energy. And for the young folks who are activists, what is your activity? I'll leave it on this because I plan to hopefully answer questions and I have all kinds of things that I could show. But I was like, yo, that's, there's another time for that. But I'll say this. In ancient cultures, in cultures before Western culture came about, Thought was considered one of the six senses. Thought went along with sight, touch, smelling, hearing, all of that, taste. It was never something to be preoccupied with. It was never something to spend all your day and time thinking about your thoughts and your opinions. And the only reason we have the luxury of doing that is because we don't have to grow our own food. We don't have to build our own houses. We do not have to fetch our water. And so you can sit around debating your idea about whatever, and that in and of itself points to the apathy and the disconnection of how serious this time is. This is a very serious time. This whole planet is on fire. And if you find yourself in a position to be able to talk about your thoughts when thought is only one of the six senses, you would never sit around all day long basking in the fact that you can hear and not do anything. So if you're an activist, if you have access to land, start to grow and allow everyone else to argue these points. Because when they're done arguing, they're going to want a meal. <laughs> I am amazed to be standing here because last piece is just to show you where I come from. I started growing food about 16 years ago in a serious way. I come from some farmers and I always knew how to grow food, but it never got serious to me until I became a father for the first time. Right when I got a woman pregnant, she looked at me, I looked at her, I said, we gotta get married. Next thing I did was I go, went out into my backyard in Pomona and started planting food. And as I started planting food, it was only because I wanted this woman to have the best food in her and this child to have the best food when it came out. And then some people came to my house and saw this food growing in the backyard and said, you should teach people how to grow food, and da 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 And I was like, okay. And from there, there's a book that's been written. I've been all over the world. I've seen all types of different things. I've been invited to all types of different places. But I was a grower first. And in the last 15, 20 years, I've had people come to me from all different walks and facets of reality that are now interested in food, but they were activists first. They were academics first. And now they're thinking, oh, I want to start growing some food. And I'm so grateful to see that, but at the same time, it puts us in a really different space. Because I didn't think about all this stuff. I didn't know anything about no Monsanto when I started growing food. I didn't even know anything about GMOs when I started growing food. I didn't care. What I cared about was the thing that we've always cared about, is that I wanted to feed my family. And I wanted to know that even if I didn't have work, which being a black man in America, I've been laid off many, many, many times. I've been fired many, many, many times. I've been harassed and brutalized by the police. Not a, not a whole lot of times, but enough that I never needed again. And I wanted to be able to say, if I'm locked up, my wife can go right out in the backyard and pick food, at least for the next month, or at least the next two months. So we want to talk about food sovereignty. We want to really start talking about what is the issue. Because if your issues are in the city, then how do you get out of your issues? Is it by changing the people's minds? Or by leaving the city? Bob Marley said, the rich man's wealth is in the city. The righteous man's wealth is in his holy place. 
Go find your holy place. Plant it up. Make it beautiful. Invite people in. No need for argument in the garden. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Vijin. Um, we're going to uh, take questions, uh, as I said, um, later. I think that will work best. Um, so we're going to hear now from Gustavo Oliveira. He's been active with Occupy the Farm since it started. He's also um, been active in other ways uh, with Via Campesina. He's volunteered and he's a student at, um, a PhD student at, uh, in geography at UC Berkeley. So he's going to talk about um, Occupy the Farm uh, and how that fits into this conversation that we're having this, this afternoon. Thank you, Nassim. Thank you, everyone, for, for having us here. Thank you for the very inspiring, empowering talk. That's really what I think we need. I, you know, we think about a lot of the problems, and we have to think about the solutions. Um, I am um, I'm from Brazil, and I got started thinking about these solutions through the fact that in my country, you know, 1% white people own two-thirds of all farmland, and that's been the way since the colonization of that land and enslavement of the people that were brought there to work in sugar plantations and with cattle and with whatnot, you know. And it's always been a struggle for land in the country. Um, and at the end of the dictatorship that started there in the 60s, you started to see uh, church groups and peasant groups that were being forced off their land start to resist. Um, and that resistance of displacement turned into an entire movement for land occupation um, and agrarian reform. It became the MST, the Landless Rural Workers Movement. I'm talking about this first instead of Occupy the Farm here because I want to tell you a little bit of who I am and why I got here and why when I was here in the Bay I fell in with some comrades who were saying, look, you know, we have to, you know, put our bodies on the line, be willing to get arrested and make sure that we keep this piece of land as farmland, as production. Um, this piece of land, the Guild Tract, how many people here, who are mostly from the Bay, have know about it? Most people know about it. Great, I don't have to talk a lot about this story or anything. And I think when Tony gets here, he'll also tell a lot more of the history and these other things. Uh, but the long story short is that about 200 acres in Albany, right on the border with Berkeley, on San Pablo Avenue, all the way down to the bay, was uh, a hacienda, was a, a big plot of land stolen from Maloney people uh, that fell in the hands of the Gill family by the turn of the 1800s to 1900s. At that time, the University of California system had already been established and had already been growing and it had been established as a land-grant institution. It has this legal demand uh, in the California Constitution that the university own farmland, work farmland, research farmland, and teach a new generation of farmers. This is a, a history that, um, like I said, you know, is part of the colonial history that we live in but it still has these um, aspects which can be liberatory if we seize them, if we use them like the vehicles that, that the brother was talking about. Over the last 100, 120 years, the Guild Tract has been increasingly privatized and sold off for pavement development, housing, and other types of urban development. Now, the 200 acres, we are left with 20. These 20 acres are the last patch of Top, top class, top one, class A, I'm not an agronomist, a really good farmland that's left in the East Bay. And we're now facing the last push of this history of privatization of the land. The 
the current 20 acres that we have had already been at this position uh, in this size by the 90s when uh, we consider that this last stage has come about. The Gill Track had been used by um, University of California researchers to do uh, integrated <coughs> pest management and other types of agroecological pest control. This land was the one of the leading centers of research on agroecology, not just in California, but in the United States and certainly also in in the Western world. By the 90s, biotech companies, chemical companies, at that moment, led especially I think by DuPont, started to give a shit ton of money for the university to do research on their pesticides. This had already been going on, of course, since way earlier. They had already had their foot in the research and in the university strongly since the 60s and on. But after the 90s, they shut down the agroecology research program that was taking place, and they start to then say, the research that we need for the future doesn't require that plot of land. All the research that we need is in the labs, with the biotech, with the GMO. The money went that way, and the infrastructure of the university started to go as well. So when we talk about this piece of land, um, we're aware of the history of this land and where we are and how it became what it is, but we're also talking not just of this piece of land, we're talking about our agroecological production systems. We're talking about whether we should have biotech and pesticides and the privatization of the entire university, or whether we should have agroecology, you know, urban agriculture as well, but not just in here. A lot of the science that was being practiced in the guild tract is science that was applied in the entire Central Valley and in several other places for you know, dealing with pests without relying on agrotoxics. Um, for this period, after the 90s, um, <clears throat> there started to be a, a more sense of urgency to defend this land and uh, community-led initiatives, much more so than the university, started to demand access to that land for community farming to feed ourselves. And every institutional means was tried. Student groups were formed, petitions, faculty, talked to every single dean that existed and that doesn't exist anymore. Petition the city of Albany, everything. Every step, they would just talk, listen, say they'll do something else, and take another step. They finally had put the land under capital controls, department, whatever. They took it out of the College of Natural Resources and they put it in the hands of the university agency that is intending to privatize it. And at, they were able to secure at that moment, and now we're already talking about 2010, uh, Whole Foods to commit to build a nice grocery store right on top of this farm to sell farmer's food <laughs> on top of this farm. Foods was smart enough to quit once we started to call them out on their bullshit, and we thought we had a momentary victory there, um, but no, we continue with Sprouts, quote unquote, farmer's market is currently the main project uh, being considered to pave over what's left of this farm, as well as a retirement home for very well off uh, old folks uh, and parking lot. Oh. This this really got to the point where all the community-led initiatives, the university-led initiatives, the student-led initiatives wasn't working out, even pressuring the people that were saying they were coming here to use it on these ridiculous um, causes was not working out. So we resorted to direct action. I think we resorted too late to direct action. We could have been much more direct about the way that we had been doing it earlier. But that was the moment when, in the aftermath of the peak of the Occupy movement, with the occupation of Oscar Grant Plaza and the displacement of this occupation and all the other occupations that we were having, we had the momentum, we had the stamina, we had the young activists, and we had this discourse of occupation, and we had this discourse of class struggle being finally, you know, really held up. So we were able to 
um, gather with a couple of folks to do a lot of the underground work that needs to be done before you can come out publicly with an occupation that was immediately crawling with UCPD mm. and whatnot. That was really surprising uh, in how strong it was and how much impact it was. People got really excited. There was so much support. And this was coming into a moment um, that we really needed to find new productive directions for that upheaval that we were feeling with the Occupy movement that weren't just asking some politician to tax some bank to fund something, to change some policy. We were talking about this land is farmland and we're going to plant on it and we're going to camp on it and we're going to hold it as such, you know, regardless of what you say, regardless of what paper gets signed between the city of Albany and the university and Sprouts, you know, we gave them the finger. Mm -hmm. They didn't like that. Um, and eventually they did kick us out. That was 2012. Uh, 2013 we went back. Uh, there was another occupation recently that we also supported. But that first occupation, um, thankfully, we had the, the pleasure and the luck, I guess I would say, to have a filmmaker who's kind of a comrade to, to document it quite well and produce it quite well. You know, I'll just show the trailer. If you want to see the whole documentary, you can buy a copy on the table at the end, and also please take some flyers. So you can kind of see, if you weren't there, if you haven't seen this yet, what this looks like. It's inherently helpful to plant a seed, because you hope that it grows. People have taken over the land and tried to rescue it. We brought up the rototillers, then we brought up the compost, and then we brought up the plants, and it was just like, wow, we're really doing this. You are trespassing. We are ordering you to leave. We will regain control of that property. The first demonstration is turning into a standoff between occupiers and UC Berkeley. This is a fight about the allocation of an asset. It's the last really prime soil in the East Bay to grow food on. This is where the proposed Whole Foods will be. Not just a Whole Foods, but it's also an assisted living center for senior citizens, and I believe some retail space. If they're left to their own devices, the guilt track will be reduced to a garden box. We believe this land will be permanently preserved for urban agriculture. They think a public asset means they can use it the way they want. It's really not the way we look at it. Our main concern is water right now. The University of Chicago, water. What we're going to be doing is handing buckets over the fence. About 6 a.m., we were woken up by some police over the megaphone. Force would be used against them if necessary, and that force could have included chemical agents. The university escalated the impacts, filing a lawsuit against 15 named individuals. You say it's a scare tactic. Does it scare anybody? Well, we're committed to farming this land, and we're going to stay here and keep farming. I need control back of this site. Somebody ran by saying, cops, rag cops, lots of rag cops. <laughs> This is public land, so we are giving it away. What they have done is given a wake-up call to the whole community. The whole point of this is to not talk about what we want, and to not demand what we want, but to make what we want real. This video is from the first occupation. We did get kicked out. We got the renegotiation started. When they went downhill again in 2013, we reoccupied the farm. Uh, with that, we were able to get an important victory, which was the commitment of the university to open access of a part of the farm to the community. And now we have a community farm there, mm. given the direct action that we've done. <laughs> we were able to distribute hundreds of forget how many hundreds or thousands of pounds of food in the community from this this occupation that we launched and the um, community farm continues but 
that is only for one part of the land. The project continues to pave over the southern half of this farm. <clears throat> and now there's no more bureaucratic hurdle. They're getting ready to bring in the tractors. Could be this month, next month, most likely after the holidays. So we're really coming down to the 11th hour. And, you know, recent efforts, uh, there was you know, Hank Herrera and some uh, indigenous folks uh, organized a ceremony there on October of this year to mark Indigenous Peoples Day. Occupy the Farm folks were there in support. We reoccupy the land there, um, you know, in solidarity with the Indigenous Land Access Committee. Uh, that lasted a couple of days only. What we're talking about now is um, we have to we have to retake it because this is coming down to to the la very last straw. One thing that also we didn't talk about here is the issue of climate. This is literally hanging over our heads and puts a much more, you know, stressful urgency on everything that we're talking about. We know that the climate bullshit in Paris now is not going to get anything done. It's not going to get us anywhere. What we're wanting to do, and this is what I want to leave with you, is an invitation to come with us this month um, to reoccupy the land and set up a climate camp. We, we want to use the space for agriculture. We want to continue using the land, but we recognize that the folks that have been really leading this particular struggle for these past couple of years are not strong enough um, to, to stop it on our own at the point that we are. We are inviting everyone that is down with us to, um, to help us do this. What I'm telling you now is very open still. Like I told you, there is no day for getting back on the land. We are con we're talking with folks from Idle No More to set up a date to go back in there together with indigenous people. Mm -hmm. We are talking with some other comrades about getting this stuff set up. But the idea is that whatever day we actually launch the occupation, we need to sustain the occupation. When the Zapatistas you know, take some land, it's land that the com community lives on. That's, they're there, it's given. The same thing with the MST in Brazil, when you occupy a land, you're occupying it because that's where you're going to make your life. You know, I'm not saying that hundreds of us are going to live in these 20 acres, but we all live here in the Bay. We all are fighting these struggles. And we want to use this space as a space where all the different types of activism, you know, where intersectionality is not a word, but where literally we can, you know, use this land as an intersection for all the different causes that everyone here is fighting on. You know, we're inviting you to take the space for your struggles and our struggles. We're inviting you to do the struggle together. So, um, back at the table there, in addition to copies of the DVD, if you want, or our bandanas, there's also a mailing list. Please um, put your email. We'll get in touch with you. We'll be inviting you. We are wanting to do this with folks and not just to impose where our idea might be. Um, so, yeah, please be in touch. The, the bandanas, they were designed and made by comrades in the movement. Um, I just want to point out, I mean, I think that it really tells us kind of what the goals are. It says around, liberate the land, cultivate community, resist monoculture, reclaim the commons. And on one side, you have farm tools and food growing and the cityscape of the Bay Area. But on the other side, what we have really is you know, some tool to cut chains. We can't just build alternatives if we're not, you know, breaking and interfering with the way that shit's going on now. The question of land, which is central, means that we can't just talk about how we're gonna do our nice, cool, vegan, organic permaculture in the land that we already have, when so many people don't have land, and so much land is being lost. We have to fight for the land to be able to build the alternatives. We can't shy away from fighting, from confrontation, from challenging property regimes, from challenging capitalism, and just withdraw into our gardens. We need space to grow, you know? We need to do this together. Thank you all very much.